I'd like to add my voice to the chorus of uh, voices, which is uh, thanking the organizers for this uh, wonderful meeting. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to discuss some work that I've been doing uh, with the postdoc at uh, Cambridge, Aristomenos Stonos, in these uh, three papers that have appeared and a fourth one that will appear soon. Uh, Aristos is not here, but I think he's watching the uh, video streaming, so hi, Aristos. One of the workhorses of uh, applied ADS CFT is the, electri uh, the um, electrically charged ADS rice and ultron black hole. And this describes holographic matter of finite charge density that's translationally invariant. Typically in the high temperature limit, but that's not going to be an issue that comes up too much in this talk. Uh, the metric you can write down explicitly, here it is, use just the function of R which is known, and the vector potential is just given by that analytic expression there. So this describes a black hole with planar horizons, with some electric flux, and this describes on the dual, in this case, uh, three-dimensional boundary, the conformal field theory at chemical potential mu and temperature T. And one feature of this, about the only feature that will be important for the rest of the talk, is this well-known fact that at zero temperature, in the extremal limit, the black hole interpolates between ADS4 in the UV, and then in the IR, it approaches ADS2 cross R2. I'm going to be interested in uh, the electric, and more generally the thermoelectric conductivity of, in a con holographic context. So let's begin by thinking about the conductivity of uh, this system. And there's this Kubo formula says, which says the electric conductivity, the AC or optical electrical conductivity, is given by this two-point function uh, of the current, current correlator, divided by omega and multiplied by minus i. And it's now a standard calculation how to calculate these two-point functions. You perturb around the, the background metric with the operated dual to the object you're interested in, and it turns out in this context there's a coupling to the metric. You solve the differential equations, you divide the VEV by the source, and you eventually come up with uh, this result. So here's some pictures of what the result is. So here's the real part of this uh, optical conductivity, and here's the imaginary part and I've plotted them both against uh, frequency omega. And this blue curve is a particular temperature, this purple curve is a slightly lower temperature, and this orange curve is a lower temperature still, and the same color coordination goes on the right-hand side. So this was uh, first pointed out by, or calculated by, by these people. This is actually not quite right. There's a missing ingredient, which is hard to get directly from this calculation, but we now know it's there which is that there's actually, for all temperatures, there's a delta function sitting at omega equals zero. So near omega equals zero, there's, uh, the, 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 electro, the optical conductivity has this delta function with, um, by electricity, a pole in the imaginary part. And this infinite uh, DC conductivity, so DC conductivity is just the optical conductivity and the limit that omega goes to zero, this infinite DC conductivity arises because we have translation invariance. So the black hole solution I wrote down before has, is translationally invariant, translationally invariant, momentum is conserved, there's no way for momentum to dissipate, and so you get this infinite response if you put on an applied electric field. What's going to be useful in the talk is just to go back to uh, 1900 and just remind ourselves of something that uh, Paul Drew did, introduced the Drude model of, of um, transport. In the simplest context, he just imagined that you had an electric field in this direction, and then you had some free particles uh, negatively charged moving in the opposite direction, and every now and again, with a characteristic time scale tau, they would scatter off some, uh, some impurities. And it's a very elementary calculation to see that the, the current, if, if E is the electric field and J is the current induced, then this conductivity in the DC limit is just given by this formula here. So n is the number of species, q is their charge, n is their mass, and tau was that characteristic time scale of the scattering. It's equally uh, simple to uh, ask what happens when you put on an alternating electric field and see what the alternating response is, and you find that you get this response here. So the optical conductivity is given by this sigma dc, this value here, divided by one minus i omega tau. So we can plot that, and it's illuminating. So here's the real part of this conductivity in this Drude model, 
Here's the imaginary part against frequency in both cases. And this inverse uh, scattering time is the width of that, what's called a Druder peak. So I'm going to call, um, in this talk, these systems coherent or good metals. So they have this nice coherent Druder peak. And the important thing, not just in a billiard ball context, but in the context of Fermi liquids, is that there's a separation of scales between this inverse scattering time scale and the, the Fermi energy. So one can make this more sophisticated than Paul Drew did in 1900. Um, so that's a, a description of a coherent Fermi liquid. And let's just point out this fact that if tau goes to infinity, just taking the limit of this uh, co conductivity, then you'll recover the delta function plus, um, can that be seen? Yeah, just. Um, uh, plus this I omega response uh, that I mentioned before. So I'm going to come back and compare and contrast uh, this, this um, example. It's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so Druda physics doesn't require quasiparticles. I and mean, I just gave you a quasiparticle description to give you some flavor of this, but it, it's not restricted to quasiparticles. In fact, in, the, in our field, Sean Hartnell and, and Diego Hoffman uh, basically made, well, for me at least, a, a lot of illuminating comment, comments when they said that basically the essential quantity is that the momentum is nearly conserved. And the momentum has a non-trivial overlap with the current that you're interested in, and then you can use this uh, formalism called the memory matrix formalism to calculate um, uh, um, uh, these response, and you find that you can, as long as you have this criteria, you can have uh, Druda physics. So these non-Fermi liquids, but with coherent, coherent Druda peaks, can be modeled in holography, and I'll talk about that later, and that's something that uh, Sean and Diego also do. There's also incoherent met metals without Druda peaks, and they can be strongly coupled, and that's then a challenge for holography. Can we, can we uh, model that kind of response in the context of holography? There's also insulators in the real world with, uh, with by definition, vanishing DC conductivity. So that's another topic that we might want to look at within the context of holography. And finally, um, there's metal insulated tra transitions where you just change some external parameter, like a doping or a pressure, by a small amount, and you get this dramatic change in the, uh, in, in the response, in the conductivity. So there's a massive reorganization of degrees of freedom, and that seems, again, a very interesting thing to try and look at within the context of holography. So to do this, the message is uh, to get more realistic metals and insulators, we have to have some mechanism for momentum dissipation. So we want to, well, what I'll talk about in today's talk is I want to consider charged black holes. There is pro-brain approaches, which I won't be talking about, but charged black holes that explicitly break translation invariance using a source or a deformation of the conformal field theory that breaks translations. And this um, whole field was uh, pioneered uh, by this very nice paper by Gary Horowitz, um, George Santos, and Dave Tong. So they um, constructed uh, some uh, um, periodic and monochromatic lattices um, uh, in a couple of contexts. One context was this Einstein-Maxwell theory coupled to a real scalar field. So you demand that your black holes have the scalar field that at infinity, at the ADS boundary, it behaves like lambda cos kx divided by the appropriate fall off to correspond to a source with a dual operator. So you're adding to your Lagrangian a source which is modulated, in this case, in just one spatial direction, x, and by one wave number k, and that's why I call them monochromatic, and lambda is the strength of that lattice deformation. Now, it's obvious uh, that in general, just from that description, you're going to need to solve PDEs to get these black holes. The black holes will depend on the x direction and also the radial direction, and you'll have to work hard. Uh, they did work hard, and they, they got some nice results. But one of the things I want to do in this talk is uh, explain to you that you can actually simplify the problem a lot, and it's led to some illuminating new perspectives. And in fact, what these, uh, these, these people did was uh, found uh, or modeled some nice coherent uh, holographic metals. And in that context, we'll certainly find some agreement, but some differences with what they did. But the simplification I'll talk about also allows us to uh, investigate these uh, novel metals and these insulators which I was describing. So the plan then is to introduce what we called a Q lattice, a holographic Q lattice, which involves solving ordinary differential equations. 
And actually, in five dimensions, this is in general dimensions, but in five dimensions, there's also a special uh, case of exploiting helical symmetry, which you can use, which has been done by these people, including our chair today. I won't be talking any further about the helical case. Um, once I've introduced this, then this result I want to explain that will calculate the thermoelectric DC conductivity, which is not just sigma, it's alpha and kappa, which I'll define later, and we get a result which is in terms of the black hole horizon data. So this is an analogous result to, what, uh, to this result that Johanna was talking about, the shear viscosity is proportional to the entropy. This transport quantity is expressed in terms of some horizon data. And that's exactly the kind of thing uh, the result will get for these holographic lattices. For sigma DC, this idea, actually there's a, a nice paper by Iqbal and Lu, and to some extent our work is generalizing what they did uh, several years ago. And more recently, there's been some related work in the context of massive gravity and other contexts where there's some similar results. Um, once I've done that result, then I will uh, give you some example of explicit Q lattices and how they can give you coherent metals with Druda peaks, incoherent metals without them, insulators, and transitions between them. Before I do that, let me just say what the philosophy is of these holographic transitions is. And the idea is very simple. This red, so here I've, I've plotted UV data. And this red curve here is a zero temperature ADS rise to Nordson black hole. So it approaches ADS2 cross R2 in the infrared. That's the starting point that I had right at the beginning of the talk. Then you imagine that you switch on the lattice with strength lambda and wave number K. And for small deformations, you certainly expect to keep flowing to the ADS2 cross R2 in the infrared. <coughs> and in fact, you can do, this does happen. And then these are the ones where momentum is uh, almost conserved. You can use the memory matrix formalism. So it's Hartnell Hoffman uh, work kicks in. Or you can actually model them in holography, and that's what uh, Gary and collaborators saw. But the transition is then uh, quite simple. You say, just crank up the data. What happens? And actually, more specifically, you can ask, say, I want to crank up the data to destabilize this RG flow. So I want this ADS2 cross R2 to have an ir irrelevant, develop a relevant operator. And then I will flow off to some new ground state. So the first examples of this was uh, in the context of helical lattices, which was introduced by these guys. And they realized a metal to insulator transition. And in the context of these Q lattices, we'll realize metal to insulator as well as metal to novel metal transitions. Now, it's not necessary that this becomes RG unstable, but it's certainly a simple way in which you can realize this transition. <coughs> So th there's been very little work on this, but I think it's a nice way to think about new, finding new ground states in holography. You take your lattice and you crank it up and you see what it does. So what's a holographic Q lattice? Well, it's a very, very simple construction. I'm gonna just illustrate with one example in four dimensions. So here we have an Einstein-Hilbert term, a real scalar, another real scalar chi, and our gauge field F. And the model is dependent on this arbitrary function capital phi of phi, this potential v of phi, and z of phi, which is a coupling of the, to the gauge field. And I'll only assume that phi, v, and z are chosen so that we have an ADS4 vacuum and uh, also an ADS rice and Nordson solution, and I'll assume that they exist at phi equals zero. Now, I'm particularly interested in the case where chi is periodic. It doesn't have to be periodic, but I'm interested in the case, and a simple case is when you choose capital phi to be phi squared, and then you can form phi and chi into a complex scalar field, and then obviously chi is periodic. And that's a case which I'm interested in, and you'll see in a moment why. But what I'm gonna just talk about also corresponds to the case when chi is not periodic. So for example, phi is one, capital phi is one, and that's kind of models that people have been looking at down here, for example. Now this model has this ga gauge U1, but it also has a global U1, which is just shifting chi. And it's exploiting that global U1 in the bulk, which uh, um, is, is to construct the lattices, is the key point. So here, we're gonna, here we'll do it. Here's an ansatz for some black holes. So the metric, uh, I've got this function U of R, and in the X1 and X2, I've got some different functions of R. In general, F, V1 would be not equal to V2. The key point here is that chi is going to be kx1. And if chi is periodic, if it's a phase of a complex scalar, for example, then clearly this is periodically break, breaking the translation invariance. 
This is a very simple way to break translations periodically while maintaining a homogeneous ansatz, in particular all the functions there are just functions of R. So we can just go and solve ODEs instead of PDEs. So technically, this is nice. More explicitly, we, uh, to construct the black holes, you have to take your differential equations and then impose some boundary conditions at infinity. And so we just demand that it approaches ADS4 in the UV uh, with a chemical potential, some charge. And we, the lattice strength deformation is in, this, is in the um, fall off of the scalar field phi. And delta is the dimension of the operator phi, joule to phi. That's the UV boundary conditions. And in the IR, you just assume you have a black hole horizon that's regular. And then you go and solve your ODEs. So these describe homogeneous anisotropic and periodic holographic lattices. Anisotropic because V1 is not equal to V2 in general. And that's specified by this U data, the temperature of the black hole, the strength of the lattice, and the wave number K. So that's, that's it. That's the construction of two lattices. Very simple. And you can, I'm sure you just can immediately think of many ways that can be generalized, what I described. And there's many lattices one can go and construct if one's so inclined by just solving ODEs. What I want to now do is describe the next topic, which is take that whole class of, of lattice black holes and let's see if we can calculate the DC conductivity analytically in terms of the black hole horizon data. So we want to apply electric fields and thermal gradients and determine the linear response. And when you're at finite charge density, there's actually a, a mixing between the heat and the um, electric currents. So if you put on an electric field and a thermal gradient, then J and Q get mixed up by this matrix here. Uh, the context I'm going to be looking at, sigma, alpha, alpha bar, and kappa bar are all going to be diagonal matrices. So I'm just going to put an electric field in, in the x direction, and I'll see the response, uh, sigma xx, alpha xx, alpha bar xx, and kappa bar xx. So let me describe this calculation, and again, it's simple. Simple is good. Uh, when I first calculate sigma, or describe how we calculate sigma and alpha bar, so we switch on a constant electric field perturbation with no thermal gradient. And I do that by just having a time dependence for the AX plus a small perturbation. So E is going to be the applied electric field. And for consistency, you need some other perturbations of your metric and fields. You look at the gauge equation of motion, and it's just this generalized Maxwell equation here. And if you just take the x component, nu is x, since everything just depends on r, you get this condition here. This quantity in the, in the brackets is therefore constant. That constant evaluated infinity is the current. So the electric current is given by this expression here. And j is constant. So if it's constant, I can also evaluate at the black hole event horizon. Now, I have to work a little bit now because I want to determine how these quantities behave at the event horizon. But you can sort of begin to see immediately what's going to happen. This perturbation has to be such that this is well defined. I've got to work a little bit harder with the Einstein equations to see what happens there. But basically, it's just regularity at the black hole event horizon. And if I impose that, it turns out with a, f a few extra lines of calculation, you can relate J and E, and then we get sigma. How about alpha bar? In fact, this ties in with something that Nick Warner was talking about yesterday. We, take, we observe that the perturbed metric has a time-like killing vector. I then build this two form by taking the covariant derivative of the killing vector. And the dot, dot, dot is some stuff involving the gauge field, which I won't write, write, write down, but it would actually be very similar to what Nick had yesterday. And a simple calculation so it shows that the divergence of this two form is proportional in this context to V, the potential, times um, the killing vector. So if I take mu is x here, oh, so this would be a mu, mu is x here. If k is a time-like killing vector, this vanishes. I have x here, and we're back in exactly the same situation here. And the nice thing is, is uh, the analog of this, which was the current there, turns out to be the heat current on the, on the, on the nose. So you do the same calculation then, you relate Q and E, and you get alpha bar. Five minutes. Um, OK, so you can also uh, calculate uh, alpha and kappa bar. And I won't let me not uh, describe that, but it's very similar. Let me tell you the results. Here is the Lagrangian that I've been talking about. 
Here is the metric uh, and the ansatz that we're using for the class of black holes. And then in this box is the result. So sigma uh, is expressed in terms of uh, the functions appearing in the metric in the, um, in the Lagrangian. Uh, and there's two terms here. And everything there is evaluated at the black hole event horizon. Kappa bar is what's appearing in here is the entropy S, the temperature, and this phi of phi evaluated at the horizon. And similarly, alpha, is, alpha bar is given by those expressions there. This term actually is the result that Iqbal and Lu had for ADS Schwarzschild. And I'll call it a pair creation term because if you don't have charge density and you apply electric field and you get a response, you're having no momentum. So it's like you're creating particle hole pairs which are running in opposite directions. More generally, you can just show from these formulas that that first term is the, the conductivity with no heat transfer. So the, this is the conductivity with no thermal gradient. This is the conductivity with no heat transfer. It turns out to be related like this, and that's what that term is there. The second term is a dissipation term. And different ground states are dominated by the first, either the pair creation or the dissipation term. Some general results is you can define the thermal conductivity at zero current as opposed to um, a zero electric field. And this is actually something that's easier to, to, to uh, measure. And kappa and kappa bar have different low temperature scaling behavior. Those formulas I had are defined for all temperatures. But you, in particular, we're interested in low temperature behavior. And kappa and kappa bar, explicitly you calculate they can have low temper different low temperature scaling behavior. For a Fermi liquid, they scale in the same way. We can also introduce this quantity, which is the ratio of kappa bar to sigma divided by T. This is an interesting quantity because for Fermi liquids, it's a constant. More precisely, it's a constant if you have a Fermi liquid with just elastic scattering. Um, we find a bound on L bar for all of these black holes, which is given by the entropy density divided by Q squared. And this bound is saturated by um, the dissipation dominated systems. There's another general result that the ratio of kappa bar and alpha is given by, again, this nice thermodynamic data, TS on Q. And I'll just remark that um, these people found some similar results using this memory matrix formalism, which applies in the context of uh, trans near translation variant ground states, whereas our results are for the general class of these Q lattice black holes. <coughs> OK, so now I'm, I'm going to run out of time, but we'll just see how far I get. Um, I now want to look at the explicit construction of black holes. And the simplest ones are the coherent metal phases, when you have some UV data. And for small deformations, we flow down to ADS2 cross R2. What, more precisely, they flow down to ADS2 cross R2, perturbed by some irrelevant deformation. And that's enough information to determine what the conductivity is. And that was shown by these guys with a small subtlety uh, that the um, infrared K is not the, latter, the UV K. There's a, a non-trivial re renormalization of length scales. Another new result is for these black holes, the thermal conductivity always scales like T. But kappa bar, the other thermal conductivity, has this scaling. So while this is always going to vanish, they're going to become insulators at zero temperature, kappa bar can either go to zero or infinity, depending on the scaling of this irrelevant deformation. One can look at these a little bit more detail, and we have Druder peaks at finite temperature. So as we lower the temperature, we're getting these bigger and bigger spikes. And that's very similar, as I said, to what was seen by Har Horowitz, uh, Santos, and Tong. One difference with what we saw with, with this work is that um, they uh, reported on an intermediate scaling where the absolute value of sigma had this uh, scaling like omega to the minus two thirds at intermediate frequencies. If that's the case, and, and also perhaps it was universal, if that's the case, then if you calculate this quantity, sigma double prime and sigma prime, then it should approach minus two thirds. And for these models, it just doesn't. So that is certainly not a universal quantity. How about insulating phases? We can now, as I said, crank up the coupling, uh, the lattice uh, deformation, and what happens. And what we find is that as we lower the temperature for these black holes, the conductivity starts decreasing. And because it de decreases, 
and there's a sum rule, what has to happen is that the spectral weight has to start bulging up in the middle. And that's exactly what we see. The final thing I wanted to talk about was what are the zero temperature ground states that appear as we do these deformations. And I'm going to have to be a little bit telescopic because I've just had the zero minutes. Um, let me uh, not tell you about the details of which models we looked at, um, but tell you about some results. We calculated explicitly these black holes that go to new ground states. We calculate the DC scaling of the with temperature. It has some exponent B. Gamma is a model, is a, is a Lagrangian parameter. We can also calculate the AC conductivity by using a matching argument with the zero temperature ground states. These are applicable in different regimes. We find these two exponents are actually equal. If they're positive, they're insulating ground states. If they're negative, they're incoherent metal metallic ground states breaking translation invariants without Ruder physics. And there's actually an intermediate case when they're equal to zero. An interesting fact is the metallic ground states are all thermal insulators. And this is the second last slide. I also wanted to mention that there's some new insulating metallic ground states where the scaling with temperature of sigma DC and of sigma AC are not commensurate. So I've plotted B and C, the exponents against gamma, a Lagrangian parameter. And over here, sigma DC is going to zero. These are insulators as we go to zero temperature. The metal's here, and the scaling goes the same way. But beyond this value of gamma, then the sigma DC continues to decrease, the metals, but this one bounces up. And if you just take one point down here, this says that uh, sigma DC is, diverge, uh, is, um, uh, is diverging, uh, but the AC conductivity is going to zero. And if you think about that for a minute, it means that there must be some new spike in the optical, in the optical conductivity, which is not true to physics. So we don't really understand this, but this seems to be a new, a new feature of, of, of these holographic models. And uh, I'm just going to flash up very briefly the summary. Apologies to the chair. Uh, summary. Um, the results of the DC conductivity, we did it in the context of these Q lattices, but it's more general. It's not special Q lattices, and we will report on a result for inhomogeneous lattices soon. The scaling of two thirds, we have also seen that, looked at this in an inhomogeneous lattice, and it doesn't seem to be there as well. Uh, and the final points was these things I just talked about at the end coherent and incoherent metals with interesting properties, and I think there's more to be done. And apologies for going over time. Questions for Jerome? Is this live? Uh, is, your, is your method particularly attached to having an ADS2 cross R2 infrared, or would it be OK to have some other uh, infrared uh, behavior, such as one sees like with uh, uh, what you call aided geometries? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so, the Q, so the Q lattices, this picture, uh, I mean, this, this diagrammatically, some of, the, some of the black holes approach ADS2 cross R2 in the infrared, and these other ones become oh, deformations. Now, those deformations actually can be rather similar, sorry, these new ground states here can be rather similar to eta geometries or ones that are hyperscaling violating and so on. I mean, but the... The general point about that DC conductivity calculation, it was very, very general. And it didn't really, it didn't require on, on any details of the fact that there was somewhere nearby was ADS2 cross R2. To answer your question another way, we could have set up this whole formalism where it's sitting down here with some eta geometry if we, if we adjusted the parameters differently. Let's thank Jerome again.